Okay, so I want to delve into the problem which I think is bedeviling Paul van der Klee, which he kind of inherits as a kind of historical confusion um, in the lineage of, you know, sort of culture that he, you know, has acclimated to in his, you know, sort of development and, and enculturation. He's just, you know, sort of, he's absorbed this because he grew up in this ethos, in this world that had these sorts of things woven into them largely implanted there by the political system. Now, I, I don't want to be too cruel about the American political system because it certainly has its kind of pedagogical obstacles and ladder to climb. And that pedagogical ladder is certainly, historically speaking, uh, far more as a lowest common denominator sort of uh, um, cultural core has, has proven itself uh, uh, to be somewhat resilient and somewhat sort of above average in terms of alternative constitutional frameworks. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, it, it has bedeviled people like Paul van der Klee because essentially um, it kind of works in an aggregate kind of secular sort of way. But if you actually are a thinking person and you are a reasonable person and in some sense you haven't bastardized some elements of the Christian doctrine to the extent to which that you can kind of just conflate issues that shouldn't be conflated. And, and the issue is something like this, that, you know, in the history of so-called Christian culture and, and in the history of the church, which I'm not that interested in because, you know, in my view, delving into layers and layers and layers of what is already corrupt is sort of, is, is, is unproductive. But essentially that there is something about the schism between the Protestants and, and, and Catholicism that sort of is thematically deep to some kind of metaphysical confusion that the corrupted church was already sort of entrenched in or embedded, uh, uh, was encapsulated within. And that is something like, uh, uh, if I can just put it, I mean, it, it, all, it all hinges. I, I think this is a, a useful reduction that essentially... The Protestants stepped away from the Catholics uh, because there's, there's something like an empirical scientist. There's something like uh, the sentiment towards be, being an empirical scientist in the Christian ethos. There, there's, some, there's some sort of approximate role to be played. You know, and this has to do, let's say, with the apophatic tradition of um, understanding theology and God. Uh, uh, that, that, you know, falsification in the scientific methodology is very much like apophasis on some level. And, okay, uh, I'm not finished constructing this reduction. That, uh, that's the preface. Now, so essentially the, the contention between the Protestants and the Catholics is that, well, we should reject rules. until we understand them. Let's, let's throw away bad rules. I mean, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm just re rehashing the issue which was brought up by, um, was it C.S. Lewis or was it Chesterton? You know, don't throw away fences th th that, that you come across. But just to kind of put it into the, hi the history and the context of this is that disposing of bad rules and knowing why you're disposing of bad rules or rejecting rules that simply because you don't understand them is, I think, resonates with the Christian search for truth and center, centering on truth. That, it's, it's, that, that Christians want to rebel against rules, not because they are good or if they are bad, but simply because they don't understand them. So the, in some sense, the impetus is to cultivate understanding. Now, already I'm not done with my reduction. So then when you have a contestation or a dispute, which was almost artificially forced within the schism between the Protestants and, and Catholicism, because in some sense, the church was not being rebelled against because it was using rules that people didn't understand, then it would have been a more pure Protestant breakaway 
in, at least in my, in my opinion, in my view, it was being rejected because the church was just so overtly corrupt. It was so overtly fudging the dogma and, and corrupting the dogma uh, for, for obviously perverted reasons. And it was unchecked power. So it was just kind of... So it was not that... It was actually the Protestants developed because there were bad rules in force. Not because they didn't understand the rules. So they didn't know that they were actually moving in the right direction for the wrong reason in some sense because they 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 weren't they so the the protestant project it was not did not correct the original corruption which was already inherent within catholicism okay um and l let me just put this in 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 the modern practical paradigm Paul van der Klee doesn't know if he's suffering from a political problem that is infecting his religious, what would otherwise perhaps be a correct or correct enough or sort of the appropriate religious uh, coherent understanding and position in the world. Or he doesn't know that if, if the politics has been corrupted by... Uh, religious problems, religious incoherence that has been injected into the system. And maybe he thinks this is a bit of both. And my point is, is that this is the problem, is that he's, he's grappling with this insoluble quandary or this insoluble um, r riddle between, is it a political problem in religion or a religious problem in politics? And, it, and it's a bit of both and it's insoluble both ways. In fact, you'll never solve that riddle unless you actually first resolve all the political problems in politics. Just remove the political problems from politics first. Perfect secularity. Have a separation of church and state. And this is the problem, is that Paul van der Klee doesn't really, really live the separation of church and state. He doesn't, really, he doesn't know if he believes in the separation of church and state. It's, not, it's an open question to him. I think that that's obvious in the things that he said. I don't know if he would agree with that. I haven't heard him say that explicitly, but I think I've almost heard him say that pretty much. He doesn't know. He, he leaves it as a kind of open question. Now, then when he talks about the Anabaptists and he says, you know, you've got some good things going for you and I can see that you've got some solutions to these problems. Well, that, that's the difference is because maybe the Anabaptists actually live in the separation of church and state paradigm. So at least if you were to cr criticize their theology, criticize their doctrine, and try to convince them of something different and refine their understanding, if you, if you wanted to, if you thought that they had a bad understanding perhaps, or something like that, then at least you could do so on a kind of independent, uh, unconflated riddle without these problems of, of, this, of this insoluble riddle of is it a political problem in politics or a now, let me, let me explain why this conundrum exists within the American ethos, because the American ethos is almost a reproduction of, of a certain kind of Catholicism. Because you haven't got a, a clear source of secularity in the American Republic. The American Republic is much too dependent on the rule of democracy. And democracy is just the tyranny of the majority. There, are, there is no rule that... Sorry, this is a complicated... Um, I just, I thought through all of this and now I'm going to probably... Um, how, to get, how, to, how to express this part because uh, this is kind of a... I'll get, I can get all the pieces of the puzzle out, but not perhaps in the, in the optimal order. Um, and what's the best way to describe it? Is, um, for secularity to work, you need to have rules. That aren't infected with the riddle, I guess that are sort of enough formal structure that 
enough of a sort of a framework uh, of, uh, that is solid and concrete enough that then you can sort of track the other things around it. The problem is, is that everything in the American political system is so contingent on the democracy. And this is, this is led, essentially, America doesn't have a proper dignified justice system. It, it doesn't have a dignified justice system because justice is following the rules that have been created by the democracy. And so the rules themselves aren't permanent. They are a moving target. So if you make bad rules, you just make more bad rules, and then you make more bad rules to cover over the pre previous bad rules. And so you've always got a changing set of rules. Now, man, I'm trying to describe this practically, but essentially, you know, how you have unchanging rules that are also flexible enough to be adaptable is that you, you have principles, you instantiate principles, and you follow the principles, and you shackle yourself to your principles. Because then then whatever happens, happens, then you can have a kind of a sensible moral judgment about it, you, you, because essentially there's a kind of intrinsic a, a system of accountability uh, that allows you to start to see the outline of what responsibility looks like. But if you can change the rules as you go along, sorry, this is a bad way of describing the, the issue in the American system. But what it, what it boils down to essentially is that the integrity in the justice system in America, because ju there are no judges in America, they are just secretaries that have to follow the rules that have been crafted by the legislature faithfully, and those rules are a, are, are a moving target to whatever the democracy wants to update them to. So if the system doesn't have integrity, it depends on the democracy, it depends on the tyranny of the majority to provide for that integrity, and in some sense it will boil in its own iniquity in some sense. Now, this means this kind of collective responsibility for making rules means that you can't use reason in a court of law in America. If you go to America and you're being judged by a so-called ju American judge, if your controversy is being judged by an American judge, while you are being judged by that judge, the law can change in your favor or against you, maybe. Maybe if it's changed against you, the updated law can't be used against you because the deeds have perhaps already been done. But if it changes in your favor and, you know, and you're dealing with the state, then maybe you can have your case updated. You know, your case can become moot because the legislature repromulgates the rules that govern how... Now, the rules of evidence in the American justice system are, in some sense, have this accountability, they have this equisality, they have this fairness, because, in some sense, those you can't move, in some sense, because you need some kind of permanent structure in order to have any kind of fidelity to any kind of so-called conveyor of reason. But the, my general issue is, is that you can't go to an American judge and use principles. You can only use you can only say, no, the legislature has endorsed these rules, I'm invoking them now. You can only use what the legislature has already endorsed against what the legislature has also endorsed. You have to say, no, the legislature is contradictory on this point, and maybe the legislature is contradictory on this point, because this was obviously made by different sessions of parliament, by collections of people all coming together uh, to, to promulgate a law. And there isn't enough coherence in that kind of system. It's too ragtag. It's too hodgepodge. And in some sense, it enforces that, well, if you want your justice system, if you want your judges to administrate a justice that can be called justice, then you have to believe that the majority is kind of on the right side of morality or something like that, or is capable of articulating rules for morality. In some sense, it means that you don't really believe in justice or accountability in a secular sense. There's no secular standard. The secular standard is just a kind of, is a rough sociological management program that is being arbitrated over by a kind of collective moral consensus. So in some sense, if you live in such a decrepit, fundamentally corrupted, structurally corrupted 
system that abuses even the concept of justice to its core. Because to have a real justice system, you would have to have these principles etched into the Republic, etched into something like a system of common law, but probably you need more than a system of common law. You need a common law system plus substantive principles where everything is already philosophically, conceptually pristine, and then you can refine the legal tests later, but in principle the law is complete and independent of politics, independent of the democracy, independent because it's held etched in stone within the Republic. And then you can use reason in a, in a court of law and you can use reason to develop the common law against even the fiat of the legislature. Because right now, justice in America is just legislative fiat, the will of the collective, within some loose bounds of a constitution which, is, which guarantees Bill of Rights, uh, which are, are really just ideological, wishy-washy, they're propaganda, essentially. They are lines in the sand to be redrawn uh, in, in, by the interpretation of the rest of, of what is on the books in terms of the legislative intent, which is trying to sort of, which is, which the judge has a duty to give a, the maximum effect to in some sense. You are ruled by the democracy. You're not ruled by reason and justice. There's no dignity for the individual. You are under the thumb of the tyranny of the majority and there's no justice because it's not in your republic. The justice is held in the whip hand of the democracy. It's no justice at all. It's the rule of man. It's not the rule of law. Because to have the rule of law, you can't just have equal protection of the law. You have to have equal protection and benefit, which means that you have to actually be able to levy against what the, what the state is trying to detract from your natural body of rights. Your natural liberty needs to be protected by a positive argument of reason, not just a negative argument that the legislature is incoherent with itself, because it's always incoherent with itself already, and it just continues to move the target and, and move the goalposts. That is the structure of the American system. It's fundamentally corrupt. And in some sense, it means that you have to collectively then convince your neighbor to develop integrity or develop a consensus to sort of unfuck the system, because the system is fucked up fundamentally. Now, this leads to a kind of de facto Catholicism, I would argue, because in some sense, you know that you are ruled by the morality of your neighbors. It's kind of like circuit board courts, schools of political schools of thought in America are sort of represented in the end by sort of boards of, of the, you know, the, the, the circuit board courts or whatever, anyway, but, you know, you're just goats, bo you, you, they're all, American citizens are all just goats, boarded up and fenced around in different schools of thinking, and they are goats waiting to be divided, really, uh, by, by some coherent reasonableness, which, you know, maybe the Anabaptists, because they at least have separation of church and state, they are on the field of, of, of testimony, perhaps to some degree, and they can be met on that field of testimony. I don't know where Paul van der Klee is. I don't see him tes testifying anything in, in his videos. He's got some secular, you know, he's stuck with this riddle of, do I have a political problem in my religion or do I have a religious problem in my politics? Or obviously I have a bit of both. And then he's just, and, that, and that's, that's what clouds his mind. I believe. I think that he's stuck in, because he's stuck in the root of Catholicism, which was already corrupted before Protestantism broke away from it. But Protestantism made a kind of, made a positive move in breaking, breaking away. And then they got sort of a small reprieve. And now they've kind of, in their historical development, at least of America, let's just say that America is the product of Protestantism to some degree. Although I would say, you, will, you see, Britain is a better synthesis of a, of, of a kind of, is a, of this. You know, another thing is you could say, well, America revolted politically from Britain. You don't want to argue with history. I was going to say perhaps a bit too soon. 
perhaps they could have philosophized a bit more before setting up these systems. But America does serve as a kind of pedagogical beacon to the world that offers a kind of a review of the philosophy of liberty and practice. And it's an invaluable historical experiment. And as I said, that perhaps there's something deep in the Christian ethos now that approximates an empirical scientist. But actually not so. That's, a, that's an approximation that's also a kind of boss, a slight bastardization. But you have to be a bit of a scientist, a bit of an empirical scientist about secular standards, about secular rules, just so that you can disambiguate the religious conundrum. We need a separation so between the world and the, uh, and the spirit so that you can learn how to grapple with it. Because if, if, if it's in, intractably mixed up, then you'll never know how, how to view the interrelatedness of it. So it's weird how some people want to sort of have this dichotomy only in some kind of in their church life, but not in the rest of their life. Somehow politics is transcendent, you know, sort of they've put politics above religion. But in some sense, I think that this is because also of the cultural enculturation that America has produced, a de facto Catholicism, de facto church, state church, or state religion. even though that doesn't fit into the dogma of the American Constitution. It, it creeps in. What else should I say? Um, so, Paul van der Klee is stuck on this confusing issue, and he doesn't get it, he doesn't talk about the issues that I want him to talk I mean, this is why I've also sort of don't listen to him that much because it's sort of, he's not interested in debating doctrine. He's not interested in arguing with doc, about doctrine to other people. He's got his bit of real, real estate. He's, it, it's a, it's a, what, what do they call it? It's a bit of a, uh, a cartel. He's got his piece of the cartel, which is, I would argue, dependent on this general corruption of the ethos and having it unresolved. And so he's stuck in the per perplexing mystification of the riddle because that's also what supports and lends credence to lending him hope that his particular school of corrupted Christianity is sort of is, is on the right side of... of uh, of the fatalism that he is working towards collectively deriving through the, the Christian culture, because in some sense the idea... The, let me talk about the original corruption, because I'm skating around it, I'm thematically skating around it. The problem with Catholicism in the first place, and again, you know, you don't want to be too cruel cool about history, because, you know, other... Th in some, the problem is, is that Catholicism had politics injected into it, and you can say, well, th that was a historical necessity, otherwise the church would have fallen and Europe would have fallen to other competing political structures. So, I don't, I, I, look, I just want to disambiguate my critique from a his. I'm not saying that history should have happened differently. I'm, that's not my point. My point is just that spiritually, this is the diagnosis, and we have to proceed in the present from this perception of what the truth is on these matters. That uh, the doctrine was corrupted because there is a tendency. For human beings to corrupt religion uh, because of their own personal defects in their own spiritual lives, of their uh, own development of their own personality, and their uh, it, because they're individually bedeviled themselves. And they want to make room for this wickedness, and so they have to disguise it. And 
there are many types of wickedness which use conventions and use rules and use dogma to make space for them. Even language. Language is abused. This is why language changes. is because each new generation, each new co cohort is trying to bend the rules to make room for their own eccentric exploration and because essentially you could say that the problem of the human condition is that we don't have a proper pe pedagogy we don't have a proper view about how everyone would ideally grow up and develop and mature and gain knowledge and fix the problems of their life and solve them you know because all of those things aren't we don't have a manual we don't have a, an operating manual for the human condition yet uh, we just have a kind of or to the extent to which that we do have things that can fulfill that role, they are encoded in the historical residue of inherited perversion and the natural gap that gets created. Because as language changes its form in order to duck accountability and make room for its own eccentric developmental perversion uh, and exploration, and perhaps misadventure, uh, because we, because we don't have essentially a um, a strong enough entrenching of things to to hold them to account, to hold things, to hold the integrity, the mirror of integrity, uh, to hold it up to people, because we don't have a full understanding of it yet, and so you could say, well. And maybe there is a full understanding of it somewhere, but they're, they're not as convincing as they could be or as they should be to everyone because the rules of secularity haven't been fully thrashed out. They haven't been fully... Uh, digested. To serve as a stable enough axle, you know, that, that you kind of, if you want to crucify the flesh, that's problematic if the flesh is a moving target and it can actually escape you, if it can actually outrun you. You have to be quicker than the flesh. Anyway, um, and the flesh is by its nature somewhat of a moving target because in some sense the flesh is fueled by the subjugation and the domination and the subversion of the spirit. It is being fueled by, the flesh is being fueled by the spirit. But a, a spirit that is led in the valence of the love of darkness, the love of ignorance, the love of not understanding, the love of an external locus of control and fatalism. And, oh, I'm being some blind faith, some sort of, oh, I'm closing my eyes because that proves how well I believe. Loving the darkness. I mean, how much do you have to love the darkness to close your eyes while you pray? So, what was I complaining about Catholicism? So, because of this general gap, because of this nebulousness which is injected into sound doctrine and understanding, which gives people the play to give room to their perversion and wickedness, that happened very early in the early church. That happened almost right away. Um, 
pretenders, imitators, who were able to access a form of the doctrine, but a bastardized form of the doctrine, a secondary abstraction. And they saw themselves as kind of scientists. They were a kind of, a kind of spiritual occult Christian. And what they were in fact doing is they were doing a kind of witchcraft, a kind of a white magic perhaps as well. And that's a lot of what the corruption in Christian culture is. It's a kind of b belief in magical thinking, a belief in, in white magic and witchcraft essentially. And what they do is they are outsourcing the computation of the understanding onto the group. They are creating a form of church, a form of communion, which is operating on a certain bastardization of the doctrine, and then they're operating in a certain wavelength, and they're operating in the world. And they're kind of like a collective agent. They're kind of like a dominion, a principality in themselves. They are one of the winds of doctrine. One of the many winds blowing about people. But a wind, one of the many disparate winds within the doctrine is just another principality of the air. Now, the alchemical element of air, which is, by the way, I believe that the water, when it says the, the blood and the water and the spirit, the water is actually, please don't be confused, the water in the doctrine of Christ is alchemically an air element. And when it says wind of doctrine and the principalities of the air, that that is... That means that they've corrupted the water with the air. Now, what is air and water? It's a cloud. It's a cloud. So they've created a mystery and they're mystified in their mystery and they are stuck in that cloud. And they're not coming out of that cloud and maybe that cloud is not the cloud that Jesus Christ is coming on. The Son of Man is coming on a cloud. Maybe it's not that cloud. Yes, you have to be confused by a mystery before you see the truth coming on a cloud. But you're in the wrong mystery, and you're in an insoluble mystery, and the horrible ironic thing is that you're in an inexact mystery. You're in a mystery which is abstractly, thematically similar to the truth, but it's a level of abstraction because you are the lineage of a misled doctrine. You have been misled by someone who is misled by someone who is misled, taking the torch further, maybe further towards integration, maybe further towards understanding the misstep that your doctrinal lineage was already corrupted. You know, it's, it, you know, just think a bit like a scientist maybe and just think maybe Catholicism, even before the Protestant Reformation, was already abjectly in the wrong direction, was already left of fields. What is it called? What's the idiom? Anyway. It was already nowhere on the right uh, uh, track. It was already so off track. Yeah, anyway. I mean, how about you turn that... How about you turn... You look underneath that stone. Leave no stone unturned. How about you turn over that stone and look underneath that stone? That, that possible contention that I've just offered to you now. What happens if the, the, the Protestant Reformation was already irrelevant because the doctrine was already so far corrupted? Because essentially this is what I say is happening in Catholicism. Is that what was happening in Catholicism, and perhaps it was a political compromise, was that, well, the noblemen and the feudal lords have so much power... Because essentially, what are feudal lords? They're basically, they're Roman aristocrats. The Roman Empire that took over the world, that then was Christianized. They're basically the descendants or the historical translation of Roman aristocrats. 
so you know the Roman Empire supposedly became Christendom supposedly who knows I think not uh, and then the feudal lords were the aristocrats of yesteryear and they had huge economic political power pseudo political economic power these Roman aristocrats became the feudal lords and the kings of European countries. And so why not, why not turn a Christian doctrine into a sociological abstraction and plug it into like a technology, like a sociological technology like, this is some good shit. This is some good theology. Let's turn it into a political roadmap. Let's turn it into a political weapon. Let's turn it into a technology. Let's bastardize it and repurpose it. Let's Christianize the state into a semblance of the doctrine. Into So, Europe puts sound doctrine into a metaphorical machine and turned it into a sociological conscription program in order to be more productive in the mythology of the state, in the mythology of nationalism and statecraft. And it did so by some kind of secular moral imprinting. So secular morality you know, in some sense, the spirit of the world was being developed into, the spirit of man was being developed into the Son of God. But kind of politically slowly, you know, that you can't do whatever you want to a serf. A serf belongs to the king. So uh, a feudal lord cannot hurt his serfs, can only punish them for transgressing the rules, but cannot kill them like, like just fodder. They, be, they, they are owned by the king. They are, the, the va they are a vassal of the king. So everyone is the servant slave of the king and the king protects them because they are his possession and when one of them is noble enough then he will ennoble them and he will give them a knighthood and maybe a title and a deed and lands and that is how human beings will progress is that when they are noble they will be ennobled and they will become peers in the realm they will join the peerage of the aristocratic class or something like that and that's the kind of political control now this is obviously weighted towards political and economic power not weighted towards the truth and it also is a kind of sociological program which maybe is a kind of form of eugenics or something like that. maybe it's good on some pragmatic level of darwinism or something like that But it's going to lead to certain confusions if you don't structure systems that have requisite integrity because they fail the mark of proper truth. They fail the mark of proper accountability and integrity. They also treat people instrumentally in a similar... But the American system obviously treats people with slightly more dignity in their instrumentality because everyone is an instrument of being su subjugated by the tyranny of the majority, which is like, on average, it's a better position to be in than to be under the thumb of a feudal lord that only has to sociologically give lip service to the Christian contemplative matrix being imported to the sociological political arena. 
sorry, I mean, I'm probably drawing out those slightly strange con conclusions. Um, or I'm not, this isn't leading into a very clear direction of, of um, thesis. But uh, Catholicism, I think, is just... Um, In, it has this curse about it, is that it has this lowest common denominator indoctrinating sort of propensity where people are just encouraged, and maybe this is, you could blame any system for having this, but I think that there, you can develop a structure that doesn't have this kind of abuse. You, you, you can disabuse a system of this kind of corruption is that you're basically blaring out, on, this is one of the lies that the world tells and that the world pollutes religion with, is that everything is just one thing. Don't think something can be more than one thing. Everything is just one thing. Everything has one reduction. Now, when you want to have everything being one reduction, then you can have a very stable subconscious. And stable subconsciouses are important for development of young children. You need to give young children low resolution pictures but you also need to show them doors that can be opened into complexities so you know you have to know the difference between the dubiousness of utilizing generalities and stereotypes and the and the and also sometimes the 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 proper use of such low grade morally dubious ingredients into one's thinking and planning and contemplative life but you don't want to run a sociological structure on the assumption that it is good enough for people to just consider things to be one thing and you know people people can't open that door that something is more than one thing because authority games authority dominion principalities and you know i mean most this reminds me Mark Lebrevem, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing his surname wrong, I've uh, not heard him pronounce it, but anyway, Mark, which uh, he has a lot of descriptions of things which I often resonate with, but the understanding that he, I really disagree with a lot of his sort of in, internal understanding of these things, but he comes to very sensible ways of talking about it. But I think that it's going to create a, a pretend culture of hollow conformists that don't really understand what it is that they are participating in because they're just parroting the rote words and that provides them a structure. But when you have the right structure, but not the actual independent understanding of it, then you just you it becomes a Tower of Babel. I think what Mark Lebrevim is trying to do is to recreate a Tower of Babel because he's trying to create the structure without the um i think that that's what it'll lead to because you can't ground these things in coordination you can't ground these things in just behaviorism and aligning your behavior with other people you actually have to have an independent understanding of it you can't just have a culture of semantic game playing and everyone is playing with the same rules of of the semantic is not good enough there actually has to be an understanding of it, but uh, it's hard to, to, to draw this out. Um, I mean, this is the problem that I see with Mark, is that he's essentially a kind of theocrat, but he's also using a kind of secular dogma or a religious, he calls it a religious dogma, but that religious dogma is anathema to my understanding of the doctrine, essentially. And so we have very different models of what's going on inside consciousness and the mind, and he is rooting everything into an external fleshly locus of control and coordination on the outside he's starting from a philosophically untenable point and because he's making that his dogma everything else is going to be poisoned by that premise because eventually that's going to cause people to huddle around that dogma and to protect it and it's going to cause a new catholicism a new kind of it's just going to be perhaps a more spiritually diffused corruption It might be more dehumanizing when when this when it produces a, an actual schism. Um, sorry. 
that could be that could lead to a very dark future i could imagine um in fact i could actually start to see the outline of how that might go let me not focus on that potential that possible future hopefully it's never is potential um because of actions done but uh and courses taken what was i saying um that it was a tower of babel but what i was saying before that is that conformity Conformity is is not cannot just be regarded to be just one thing good. It's not good or bad. So, yeah, trying to sort of engineer enough conformity so that there is enough alignment in the system or potential alignment in the system, I think, is um, making the system more sticky. I think people should stay segregated on their islands of confusion until they can actually join up authentically through their understanding and they'd be found in the condition at which they are actually at i think the current culture is wonderful i think the winds are standing still there there is the world is standing still and people can see where they're standing now i think even without the patience to look they are stuck in a kind of static pattern which they can't even deny themselves that they are in a recurring loop of some kind and that is a tremendous reflection tool of for self-awareness and self-mapping mark is trying to connect the islands and i think that the island should not be connected unless people I guess, you know, he's perhaps just offering the tools that he thinks would be helpful to people, but I guess I I just despise his dogma, essentially. Anyway, sorry, I'm, let me get back to what I was talking about. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to find the thread that I've just put down. Nothing is just one thing. So if nothing is just one thing, if nothing is not just one thing, then um, then you can't use false authority as easily as you otherwise could. So people are really stuck with these sticky, sludgy things, which they kind of, as soon as they use it, it becomes a part of them, and then it fixes all their thinking into a kind of dogmatic sludge. And this is the general style that all dogma, all any, any rule that is not understood, is not palpable to the understanding, I think is anathema to the light uh, of reason, which was the first thing that God created in existence, the light of the mind, the light of consciousness. Reason and understanding are not exactly the same thing. Um, in some sense, I think the understanding is more about apophatic understanding. You have to understand via negativa. You understand the darkness so that you can contend against the darkness, that you can keep your eyes open watching for the enemy, that you understand what you know not. Those who loveth God, sorry, those who loveth not knoweth not God. Oh. That is actually what it, uh, you see how many negatives there are there. So I'm, I'm referring to, to the scripture in First John chapter 4.
So people can, can be impelled by some reason as they have made a compromise with their reason. And they actually have got a bit of love of darkness in them, but they ha also have some love in them. So they have some reason, but they don't have a full commitment to a full understanding and having a fully justified understanding. This is the problem, is that people have just given up. They say, well, I can be, I deserve sympathy, I've got a good excuse, I can compromise. People should give me my compromise. They should afford it to me. And that, and that is really the root that all, this is how perpetual corruption just goes up on and on and on it's given new life by its new history people this has happened because people have said i want to salvage this history this history is too good is too close to something i want to continue being a mad scientist a mad experimenter I'm going to monkey around with it see if i can make it work and salvage all of this lost energy Instead of sublimating it into an awareness of darkness, into apophatic uh, knowledge. The indirect path to God and truth by cataloging the dark sayings of the Lord. Because, you know, people look over the teachings of Jesus when he said, to be worthy to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you must hate your mother and your father and your brother and your sister and even your own life. Those are the things that you must intellectually detach from so that you are capable of being truthful about them in your own reasoning, in your own development of apophasis. That you can say that these things are not just one thing, so you can turn over every stone. No stone left unturned. That is how... Th that is the process of the crucifixion, that is the process of the work of salvation. Sorry, I'm using as allegory as it was designed to be. Uh, Jesus Christ is a role model of understanding God. Jesus Christ is in fact the correct name of the mind. The only begotten son, that is what your mind must be. It must burden all the responsibility for the world so that it can come into an understanding and overcome the spirit of man and the world and the flesh. And that's a continual overcoming because you are quicker than it And converting churches into experimental laboratories that don't understand and that even say that will never understand but collectively will amount to something that overcomes it through a blind faith in some strange readings of some parts of the Bible and complete ignorance of other parts of the Bible. You know, it's just, um, uh, I would see it as a kind of, well, I mean, there's, there are lots of misleading doctrines anyway okay so um i guess i'm going to leave this on this kind of note not that great uh, but i think i dealt with all the issue i mean it's just
you know. I guess I can't come up with a pithy conclusion for this, you know. Uh, trying to summarize it in a pithy way, I'm going to say something stupid and inexact and imprecise, like, you know, sort of just put down the unclean thing. Uh, look afresh, you know, kind of look afresh with the vision and the faith and the prayer that you can come into a full understanding and that things will not be uh, beyond your uh, your investigation and actually forthrightly seek, you know, forthrightly ask, you know, and maybe you should ask what are the right questions that I should be asking. Maybe that should be one of the questions. Uh, anyway. <laughs>